I would like to introduce the first speaker of today's session. It's a great pleasure to have Dr. Swan Lauer from the University of Tartu with us. Dr. Lauer holds a PhD degree in computer science, which he completed in 2008 at the Helsinki University of Technology. And since 2008, Dr. Lauer has been affiliated with the University of Tartu in, in many different roles, including um, a senior research role, senior researcher role. He was also a project manager at Stock. Uh, just for everyone, Stock is an MLFPM partner, and he was in this role between 2015 and 2021. And Dr. Lauer is an expert in privacy preserving data mining and cryptography. And today, his lecture will focus on how to extract information from medical texts. And we're very excited about that. And with that, uh, Dr. Lauer, please, the floor is all yours. As I was introduced, I hold the many positions in the, in the university and stack. And one of them is to actually do practical data extraction from medical um, texts. And I have been done doing this for 10 years. And during that time, we have failed like at least three times. And there are lots of kind of things to, I have learned. And, and, and today I'm going, trying to give you kind of a high level overview what you should know if you do a um, want to do a fact extraction from medical text, so well, let's uh, let's just see what is a fact extraction. So let's say that you have a medical text and you want to know uh, lab measurements, but unfortunately those are not in structured form, but those are actually inside text. So you can see here there is a date here. And then follows the analyte. Okay, it's an Estonian. Then it has a value, and it ha also has a unit. But um, below that, okay, there there are still those analysts, But sometimes there is a unit present. Sometimes there is unit is not present. And obviously, this text is not tagged like like here, so that that you know what are there. And the question in case of uh, fact extraction is to find out those facts from. Um, there are like um, um, many many reasons why you should why you should use effect extraction. Uh, one of them is if you do want to study adverse drug reaction, then you have those patient complaints. They should be in structured form in medi um, medical health records, but usually they aren't because kind of reporting adverse drug reaction is kind of a, takes some time and um, it's, it's much easier for the doctor to just write that, okay, patient complained uh, nausea and that's why we, we changed the drug. Um, the same thing is, is also true with, with, let's say, with disease description. Usually you have a formal code in, in, in this medical um, text, but, uh, but, what, what, but some um, kind of aspects of the disease are written only in textual form. And when you have um, like biopsies, x-rays, uh, CT scans, all of those are um, usually in textual form. So if you want to know whether, whether there are certain type of um, cells in, in the biopsy, or certain types of anomalies in the biopsy, you should actually study those texts. Um, the, and the, okay, the, the, the application wise, you, most of the first three are just um, kind of, um, um, kind of uh, epidemiological or clinical studies wh where you can use them, but um, sometimes you can use um, fact extraction to um, kind of, in other machine learning projects. For instance, if you would like to do uh, image recognition, so you have a large set of x-rays and you have a patient records, then the problem usually is that those um, records have to be labeled. And, uh, and now you usually have this um, x-ray and you have a corresponding description and it would be very, very handy if you could actually extract some important facts out of it. And in that way, this fact extraction becomes as input to another machine learning method. And essentially, 
what the information extraction allows you to do is that it, first of all, it allows you to um, uh, fill up the gaps. So sometimes doctors don't um, kind of uh, write down the um, uh, data into the structural um, uh, fields. Uh, information systems don't write data into a structural fields because, okay, it's, it's hard to integrate them and it, they didn't have money or what, what not. Um, the, other, the other one is that sometimes those factors which you are interested in are, are not kind of normal in a structural way. For instance, you wouldn't like the doctor to actually click and assign your lifestyle, right? whether you have a lot of stress or you are, you are kind of in a peaceful mood or you have some crises or so this is not what you want the doctor to do. So usually this is written in free style. Uh, free, free text and therefore you need to kind of uh, extract information out. Uh, um, sometimes, uh, as I said, you, you want to do a disease subtyping or you want to do kind of and define a, some, some sort of refined treatment outcome. Let's say for stroke, you would like to know whether patient needed a speed therapist or not. Uh, again, this is not in a structured uh, data, but usually in the text that is written that okay, there was um, the doctor arranged a, a speed, um, speech therapist arrangements, or there is actually a description of what, the, what, what was done there. So, so in that sense, um, these textual fields are very important. Um, and as, as I said, um, through this um, kind of um, lecture, I'm using very simple uh, task here, yeah, which is a measurement extraction, because this is something which you all can relate. So there are lots of measurements and uh, they have very simple structure. So if you want to extract the measurement, you want to know what was measured, what was the corresponding value, what was the units and when it was measured. Um, and, um, and now, um, and now um, let's say that you build this system and it will take text and convert them into the tables. Then you have a problem in, in, in structured data because usually the measurement extraction is very noisy. You, you get um, a kind of uh, various misspellings in the fields. You, you get the fields, but those are misspelled uh, or you get them um, wrong terms. So, so there is a first thing you have to do after this kind of measurement extraction is you have to do a additional natural language processing task, which is a very boring and laborious, is that you have to clean the values do the standardization. And sometimes you even need to do the harmonization and conflict resolution, meaning that you have a different sources and then you have to check that whether they are contradicting or not. Um, so this is a kind of, uh, in case of natural language processing, the first and most simplest task you have to do. And this is usually the most uh, important thing to do because when you have a medical record, it has easy things to extract and hard things to extract. And, uh, and, and you should usually start from easy things unless you are looking for particular things. Uh, the next thing um, to consider is that sometimes data is, is in a format format way it's either in the HTML or XML format and therefore then you can actually know where the field starts and where the fields end but you don't know how the data is organized so the idea here is that you have to first of all detect what in which format the data is and usually the data is in several formats there are several different ways let's say to write down the analysis tables and and you just have to unify them and convert them to into a uh, common format. Um, then uh, considering another task, which is, um, is now more complex, is that when you actually want to extract the data from free text, then, um, then usually the free text is not completely unstructured. It's, it's a semi-structure. In case of uh, patient records, those are actually split into the small snippets of text 
where each of them is kind of dated. So in, uh, let's say in October, I, uh, the patient, uh, patient came in and then they, he complained about that. But in, 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 in September, there was um, another entry and so on. So essentially you have to do a format discovery uh, and split the text into small pieces. And um, when you do that, um, you have to kind of recognize patterns in the text, which are sometimes not correct. So, so this is usually in computer science terms, kind of referred as a robust parsing. So you have to kind of recognize important markers and split the text into pieces. Finally, um, well, there is the, the most complex task is, is, is when the data is indeed in free format and there is no structure. So this is uh, like this one, uh, this is in free format. So, uh, and you have to recognize stuff inside here and there is no markers to help you. And, and here there are like three basic tasks which are very important to do. The first one is the segmentation. The Another one is when you have split the text, uh, then you have to order those segments according to relevance. Mm, just the, the relevance is that, let's say, if you want to extract measurements, then you just order the element kind of segments uh, and the topmost most certainly contain um, measurements and bottommost you very unlikely uh, to contain measurements. And, the final task, obviously, is to do the facts extraction. Um, now, um, depending what you actually want to achieve or what is your task, there are um, three possible um, ways to kind of approach this fact extraction problem. Um, the first one is that you will just um, take your time, look through the text and do this um, extraction manually and usually the, the easiest way to deploy that is that you have a, some sort of actual table and the one column is text, the other one is the fact you want to extract, let's say a measurement uh, and, and that's it. This is very easy to set up and in many cases this is enough. So if you have, let's say, a thousand uh, medical documents to look through, there is no reason to kind of uh, set up um, a complex fact extraction pipeline. By the time you, you set it up, you, you, can, you, you, you can solve this in Excel. And the, the only reason not to set it up if you know that this is not a one-time project or, or, or it's infeasible to look it through. So this leaves you two other options. One of them is that you will use some sort of um, annotation program which allows you to um, kind of use some machine learning uh, inputs, uh, but, but you have to make the decision by yourself. So this is a kind of manual labeling where you use machine learning as, as a kind of tool to make it easier for you. And, and finally, obviously you can use just automatic machine learning pipeline. Um, the main distinction between those two is, is the question whether you can allow, what is the error rate you allow to do? So if you do, let's say a genome-wide association studies and you do a deep phenotyping, it, you can allow, let's say 10, 20% errors in the, um, in the, in the extraction. Um, okay, the, the signal will decrease and maybe you don't find all the SNPs which are associated with this deep phenotype, but uh, essentially nothing bad happens. However, if you, let's say, want, want to build a decision support system, then, then this is not acceptable and, and therefore then there has to be this human component which actually looks through what the machine has done. Um, <coughs> The, the other aspect to consider is what should the mas machine do? There are like three things the machine can do. So we can make a prediction. Let's say, let's say that this document contains this um, cholesterol measurement, um, uh, blood sugar measurement and so on. So this is completely automatic. Uh, this is harder to achieve. Then there are, um, 
two other tasks. One of them is this focus. Instead of um, telling you that, okay, that this is the extracted value, it says that, okay, I have a large set of text and, and it ex actually the measurement can be only in this um, small paragraph. And, and this is kind of very important when you do this manual accurate um, reading because you don't want to read all the text. So this is automatic focus is important. Um, and the other thing related to this is automatic ranking. So even if you have extracted the segments where the measurements can be, some of them are more probable to contain measurements than the others. And since you have a finite resources, you should be kind of able to rank them and look through the most promising ones and kind of skip and then at some point say that I don't uh, kind of read more there. Okay, so um, let's say that we want to do this um, measurement extraction. So there are like typical steps here, what you should carry out. Uh, the first and the most obvious is that you should just look at the text to see whether you can solve this task or not. Uh, for instance, we were kind of looking at this antibiotic uh, prescription in uh, hospitals and we wanted to know, okay, can we kind of um, see whether there were some complications with antibiotics, but we had to drop that project because we looked at the text and discovered that, okay, this is not actually typed into the electronic health records. So, so this first step that you actually expect the text and see whether you can uh, yourself extract the facts is very important. Uh, the next thing is that when you do that, you see the initial structure of the facts. And um, when you do that, you, you will, let's say that you, if you do a measurement, then it's quite obvious that the measurement must contain a numeric value. And also, okay, it, it, it must contain an analyte and uh, um, there are not kind of infinitely many lab measurements. There is actually a, a certain list of uh, measurements you can do. So you can build a term list and for extracting the numbers, you can use regular expression, which match a certain um, kind of strings of certain structures so you can uh, recognize numbers, uh, let's say telephone numbers, um, specific codes. Um, and this is kind of um, the first thing you do. And this allows you to kind of annotate text with uh, potential components. And based on that, you can do the text segmentation and also find the uh, regions of interest. And this is very dumb. Essentially, this is uh, nothing more than advanced uh, search in, in text. So instead of uh, and of uh, typing control F and uh, cholesterol, you just uh, do it automatically. But this is surprisingly efficient, uh, usually, um, because it allows you to kind of do the, find out the prospective data paragraphs. And, and it's important because um, the, the data what you have is, 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 me, is, 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 a, is a scarce data. Um, if you have, let's say, um, measurements, they are not written in each uh, textual field. They are done in certain intervals, usually rarely when you have a specific measurements. And, and therefore, if you want to build up a, a, a set of um, training samples where you have a data and the corresponding value, uh, then and you do it kind of naively, then what happens is that you have to read a lot of, uh, through a lot of texts and it, it is slow. And let's say you read like thousand texts and you get like 10 positive cases and this is not a good way to do. So therefore uh, the term lists and regular expressions are your friends because they allow you to kind of uh, throw away a large part of irrelevant irre texts. Next, obviously, is that you use a, some sort of classical machine learning method and, and, and uh, you have now a labeled data and, and then you train and validate the model and see how well it behaves. And here to, just to notice is that the task what you want to do 
Um, first of all, you need to detect uh, whether a certain fact is in, in, uh, in a text or not. Usually the unit of text is sentence. So the question is whether a measurement appears in the sentence or not. And this is very already very powerful if you do this kind of curated text extraction because this allows you to kind of uh, show the, the curator only the sentences which possibly contain measurements. And the harder task is actually do the extraction. So you know that the sentences um, information is there, but now you have to extract it out. Um, and yeah, the third one, which I already said, is the prioritization, which text to look through. Um, and usually when machine learning people think this is the place where it ends. So you have a model, it works, it extracts the text and that's all. But this is, this is not actually the place where it ends because uh, uh, you might get facts. For instance, you might actually get the fact that the patient weight is 1.6 uh, uh, kilograms, uh, but uh, this is clearly incorrect number. So, so, so you, you have to put additional filters, which will kind of find out that this is not a true. Another one is that usually in Estonian text, um, there, there are like um, cases where patient weight is like uh, 3.4 or let's say uh, 2.7 kilograms. And th those are associated with, uh, with females. And, and this means that actually the, um, the weight is not the patient weights, but actually uh, is newborn uh, child weight. So the, there are things you consider kind of, this is another set of validation which you have to do in order to use this data correctly. Um, another aspect to consider, this is a kind of a technical one, is that there are like abstraction levels in text mining. And if you kind of um, neglect some of them, then you might get into the troubles. Obviously, uh, you, you would like to work on um, phrases and sentences. So you would like to take a phrase or a sentence and kind of extract a measurement out of it. However, you have to think about other things as well. So let's start from the most boring ones. Uh, this is the fact that um, the texts um, um, stored in computers as bits, uh, and in particular characters are written as bits, but uh, how they are written, there are many ways to do it. You can use a uh, UTF, uh, uh, encoding, you can use Latin one encoding, there are very many encodings and um, sometimes information systems or um, doctors computers mix them up so they um, they take um, a text which is let's say written in latin one and interpret this as a unicode text and then the original content gets mangled so and then you get kind of very weird uh, looking um, sequences of symbols which actually corresponds to some uh, reasonable text if you if you would encode them in, in correct way. Uh, so this is a, this is a kind of um, problem because the, when you kind of interpret them um, kind of characters in wrong way, the, the all the next steps will fail. Usually this is not uh, very important, but um, but sometimes when you get kind of um, errors. And this, you have to actually consider this one. Um, the next thing um, you have to consider is a tokenization. So essentially, if you have a set of um, characters, then you have to split it into the words. And this can be non-trivial thing here. So here, for instance, um, there are like um, this number and this number and this number. And it's really hard to kind of say whether this is actually a date and then there is a, a, a measurement unit, or this is a year, and this is a measurement where a kind of this period is missing from here. So there are lots of problems with, with this one. In fact, it's because doctors write um, no, uh, text in hurry and make a lot of mistakes. So there are lots of issues here. And um, the next 
kind of level you have to work is um, is that when you have a words, then you want to actually annotate them. Um, the reason for that is that um, all machine learning methods use some features, and actually it's very important that you would kind of give them a kind of right morphological features, or if you use, let's say, some sort of terms that you will recognize that this penicillin is a, um, a antibiotics uh, which correspond to a certain code, or you would like to, let's say, now know that the liver is inside the abdomen. So there is like those kind of annotations you have to put on the text. And when you have this annotation play in place, it's, it's much easier to build those um, text segmentations and text extraction algorithms. So uh, the last kind of uh, general thing to consider is, uh, okay, how do you solve this task? Mm. Um, there are like uh, three basic ways how you can solve it. You can use knowledge-based methods then you can use supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning. The knowledge-based methods um, are, is, are, are kind of structured in the following way that you, um, you have external knowledge. You have, let's say, a list of um, all possible um, analytes or all possible drugs or all possible kind of body parts, uh, and then, then you just recognize them in, in the text or, um, or you have a, a, a certain rules how to write down a phrase that the patient uh, smokes. So you can have a phrase that patient smokes one pack of cigarettes, smokes heavily or, or, or so on, but um, you can actually kind of think and come up with a, with a description which kind of describes all possible ways how you can describe the patient's notes. And um, these methods are actually um, surprisingly um, efficient uh, because there, there are not much resources what you need to do. So you have to have some sort of lexicons, ontologies and some sort of standards but this is, you need this all, this anyway, in order to do the data cleaning step uh, on top of this fact extraction. So usually this is, this is easy to achieve. And in many cases, we can actually stop here. And this is, gives you good enough results. Um, but, uh, but sometimes this is not the case. Uh, let's say that you want to do those, um, um, task which are a bit fuzzy. So um, kind of measurement extraction is, is kind of easy because it has a very specific structure for the phrases. But uh, let's say that uh, the, the fact that patient is um, uh, um, has a um, is, 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 is in, in stress, is, has a high stress level or has a problems. This is something which you can't kind of um, a structure kind of has can't write all possible ways how this is described in a text. So in this case, you have to do the supervised uh, machine learning where you have a labeled text and um, and you train a method. Yeah. So the problem here is that you have to have text with annotations. So this is a problem. So you you need to at least one thousand or more positive examples. Um, and, and as I said, since the positive mentions of a fact are rare, this means that you need to kind of look through many, many texts, let's say maybe even let's say uh, 50,000 texts. And, and this is a, a significant burden. Okay, you need to use GPU or uh, CPU time, but okay, this is cheap. You can do it uh, compared to annotating texts. Um, so the, the one way out of it is to use unsupervised machine learning. Uh, so the idea here is that you use unlabeled data um, or text to learn some sort of general model. Then you use few text annotation to fine tune that model to predict the thing you want to do. Um, or, and, and this thing kind of uh, requires a lot of GPU time 
when you do this general model, but when you have trained that one, the kind of uh, specification or fine tuning requires a little time. So this is kind of, um, kind of currently the best or holy grail of doing fact extraction. And um, there are like um, three aspects here to remember. So the first one and the oldest one is a word embedding. The idea here is that you take a word and associate a vector with it. And if you do it cleverly, like using web to vec, this vector capsules the semantic meaning of this word. Um, and, and based on that, you can do quite a lot. Uh, but but the, the kind of the next generation is this um, idea of transformers where the idea is slightly different. The problem with word embeddings is that for each word you have only one vector, but uh, usually the words have different meaning and this depends on the context. So the transformers uh, kind of assign a different um, word embedding based on context. So this is a context sensitive embeddings. And the two most famous right now is this GTP3, which is not available, but the PERT, uh, which is kind of available and there are many versions of that uh, and there are like medical versions of that but I don't know whether they are available or not but, but this is where you, you could start and another thing to do when when you don't do direct prediction whether this okay the uh, fact is in the sentence or not is as a similarity scoring. So you would like to you have certain seed phrases about smoking and you would like to know what are the other similar phrases which could be related to uh, smoking. And then you use a similarity scoring. And the thing to remember is this word, word movement distance, um, which allows you to find similar phrases. Okay, mm. now we I'm kind of reached the second block of the uh, my talk, and this is kind of a, a kind of a more practical oriented. Or in, I give an overview: what are the, the tools you you can use in order to do the fact extraction? And I uh, and I start from the simplest ones. Those are the rule based methods. So those are the knowledge based methods. And um, uh, kind of um, this is um, kind of very important is that you when you do some sort of fact extraction task, and you can use uh, existing standards, and then you should um, kind of collect all of them uh, and try to use them. So if you work with diseases, there are this ICD-10 as in Estonia. But there is the SNOMED, which is another one. For lab measurements, there is a standard. For drug names, there is a standard. For anatomy or body parts, there are standards. Uh, so you, you should just kind of somehow collect all of those standards and extract the terms there. And uh, by doing that, you get this initial term list, which, is, uh, which, which, which could be used in the text. In real life, this is not how the doctors use those things. They misspell the terms or use a different term. So what you do is that you take this initial term list and unlabeled text and uh, do some sort of fuzzy matching and you get an extended term list. And then you kind of throw out false positives and that stuff here and they get kind of final curated term list which is the list which you just uh, match on, on the text. And, and this allows you to find out, let's say, uh, all uh, mentionings of the drugs. And this is kind of, or all mentionings of the uh, measurement analytes. And this is already a powerful thing because you can do text segmentation based on that. Essentially, you take a match, take like 100, or 200 characters to the left, 200 characters to the left, to the right, extract this text. And uh, it is very probable that this will contain a measurement or in case of drugs, that this will contain um, a doctor's prescription of a drug or, or something about the drug. 
Okay. Um, the other thing which, which is important is this um, regular expressions. So uh, you can't um, write a list of all po uh, possible states or all possible numbers because there are like infinitely many of them. So instead of that, um, you just use regular expressions uh, to kind of fix the format. Let's say for the date, there are two numbers followed by another two numbers uh, followed by another two numbers and in, in between there are dots. And you can kind of specify a number formats and you can, uh, this language is quite, um, description language is quite powerful and you can do all wonderful things here. But mainly you would like to get those um, numbers, uh, dates and some special symbols and some headers uh, to find out. But what you shouldn't do is that you shouldn't use regular expressions to kind of capture um, some variations of the terms. Uh, those are, this is a practical reason because um, handling a long term list is, is much more efficient than handling uh, regular expressions. There are kind of uh, libraries which will match long term list very fast compared to the um, regular long list of regular expression, this will be a bit slow. And sometimes if you're not careful, you, you will write um, regular expressions um, which, which don't do the things you kind of uh, intend. So this one kind of intuitively says that you want to match A or AB or AC, but, um, but you can write it in two ways. And depending on which way you write it, it actually does different things. So this one matches only the A and, and doesn't match AB, but this one start, tries first to match ABC and if it fails, tries to match AB and then A. So, so this matches ABC uh, and AB and A. So this will can create you a lot of confusion. Um, now, um, now, when you have kind of set up um, a term lists and uh, regular expressions, then um, usually there are surprises. So essentially you miss some um, way of writing a date or some way of writing a number or, 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 or some way to write a header. And, um, and if you are not careful, the, what you do is that you will just um, update your regular expression and um, go further. And, but this, is, this, is, this, this can lead to a problem. So essentially the problem here is that when you change a regular expression, it can actually change the, um, the, the way it behaves and you, you might not um, kind of get a kind of get the regression in a way that you forget certain uh, other formats. So the right way to do it is to just um, um, each time you see a problem, you write a you extract the corresponding text and uh, check who, always whether the kind of then that, that you you are able to match that. And if you do that, you will actually get a kind of a documentation why this regular expression is, is, is such, and you, you will get this kind of gradual improvement thing here. And um, kind of another thing is that you should, uh, you shouldn't rewrite a regular expression. You should have some sort of um, common library, which you kind of update. Um, the third um, way to do um, um, kind of extraction, um, which is rule based, is this using a grammar. And essentially, what the grammar does is that it gives you a list of rules uh, which uh, describe phrases, or in a way, it describes how to kind of um, combine um, words into the phrases um, and Let's see what it says. Uh, if you want to do this um, measurement extraction, so let's let's just uh, go back and see how does it look like. 
So we have these things here. And okay, we, we know, let's say that this is a number, this is a unit, and, um, and this is a date. And now uh, what the um, phrase grammar tells is how you can combine those into a measurement. Mm. And 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 it usually how how you how you read that one is that if you have a number and a unit, then you can kind of um, combine them into a quantified number. So this is a um, a rule in a in this uh, grammar. Um, and another rule, what you can have is that if you have a date analyte and a quantified number, you get a measurement. And uh, with two rules, you can kind of match um, quite a many of, of measurements, but sometimes people don't write a date. So you, you, you should be able to also match that if you have an analyte and this quantified number that you get a measurement. Um, or sometimes people forget about units. So you have a date, analyte and a number, and this is also a measurement. Um, in extreme case, you have only the analyte and number, and this should also correspond to the measurement. Uh, and um, and so what? So in a way, you you see is what you see is that you you will have annotations on text, and then you combine that, and you get a new annotation on top of that. And uh, and obviously, we are interested in measurements, so. So this is the final symbol we are looking after or, or phrase what we want to combine. But sometimes you, you want not to uh, kind of recognize only one of them, but you can um, get, um, get kind of um, more kind of outcomes. So there is not only one final kind of uh, symbol you want to extract. So it's not that you would like to extract measurements. Sometimes you would like to extract quantifying numbers as well. Um, the, the other thing is that um, we have here many rules, but we have to fix an ordering in, in uh, how the rules are applied, which rule is tried first, which is tried second and, and so on. So there is a rule priority. Uh, so let's see why is this um, necessary. Uh, so let's say that I have this canonical phrase, which is starts from a date, which I know. Then I'm, I'm checking for the analyte and for the quantified number. Okay, and here I have a quantified number. First of all, I see that there is a number and a unit. So I, I, I treat this block as a quantified number. I see that in front of that there is a um, analytes and the date and therefore I know that this is a complete match and this must be a measurement. But um, sometimes I have these incomplete matches and I also have to match these. Now um, I have this rule that when I have a number and a uh, analyte then I can declare this as a measurement. Now if, um, if I don't have ordering then in this phrase, I also have um, the um, analyte and the measurement, and, um, and, and, and this is also a match, and this is also a measurement, but I really usually want to have maximal match. And the priority is, is to resolve this issue, saying that let's first try to combine this thing. If this fails, uh, let's try other rules which are um, less precise. So if I can't have a date analyte and a quantified number, okay, then I have to try the analyte and the quantified number. So, so this matches this one. Now, um, now this doesn't match that one. So I tried the first complete rule, it, it failed. Second rule failed, so let's try. Uh, we can try the analyte and the quantify uh, uh, date, analyte, and a number. Okay, this matches this one, and and for this one, all three rules fail, and I have to use the fourth rule. So, so this is um, this is the way how this um, kind of um, grammars work. Um, 
just to uh, mention, normally when uh, computer science uh, people work, they write those in, in another direction. So uh, but the meaning is, is, the, is the same. So um, here I have written how you combine the things, but if you revert them, direction those is how you generate. But since we are working with text and try to re recognize this is the way you should look at it. Um, um, here, uh, another thing to consider is that at the end of the day, you want to have a match, but you want to decorate that. And, and this is the, um, uh, uh, another thing you, you can uh, add to the rules is that uh, when you combine the things, you will extract some attributes out of it, yeah. So if you combine this record kind of thing, then you will extract from the first the date, uh, from the second, what is the analyte, from the word, what is the value and, and the unit. Um, and for incomplete phrases, obviously you can't extract all the attributes, but some of them. So, so you have to remember when you specify a phrase grammar, there are two things to consider, is that uh, how you, what is the correct phrase and what is the information or annotations on top of that phrase. And when you have this kind of um, grammar, it's quite easy to propagate this information up. And you don't have this detection extraction problem that you can detect the phrase, but you can't extract what is inside the phrase because uh, essentially you can take care of that by these um, annotations. Mm. Um, there are two um, kind of um, uh, two other aspects here to consider, which are, which are kind of interesting. Here is that sometimes um, you, um, you you do I try to match in a text, and then you get some kind of uh, mismatches, so that it doesn't match. So you have, let's say, you have only quantified units, and then it's, it's really important to kind of see those because near those, usually there are those um, kind of terms or uh, analog names which were not in your initial list. So, so by just looking why sometimes we, we parsed only half of the phrase allows you to improve the term lists. Mm. Um, um, and um, yet another thing to consider is that um, usually um, computer science people are very religious about those things. So they say that, okay, if you have a number and unit, it, it always has to become a quantified number. Uh, but if you are doing in practice, you would like to keep those, this set of rules very simple because um, because if you have like 100 uh, of rules, then you quickly lose track what those, those mean. And therefore these rules are, are not precise in the sense that they usually match more than it's intended. Um, but, and, and in this way, you might get a um, kind of recognized measurement, which are not measurements. The way to counter that, um, is um, add additional checks which are not in the grammar. So uh, you have here a measure, uh, uh, an analyte and a number and uh, the rule says that you should combine them. But let's say that um, you know what are the all possible values of cholesterol measurements and you see that, okay, this uh, 2000 is too much and then you can abort this kind of combination and say, okay, although I have a uh, analyte and a number here, this doesn't correspond to a, a measurement because um, those are incompatible. And if you kind of use this kind of additional checks idea, what you get is that you can get much, much simpler grammars where this um, kind of um, matching part is not inside the grammar, but actually inside the, uh, inside the um, 
kind of additional functions and you can use actually a machine learning to see whether these two can um, kind of be combined or not. Um, the last thing which um, has been a big headache for us is that um, usually when people talk about tokenization, they say that, okay, yeah, you tokenize the text, make it into the, those small chunks and then you try to combine them and that's it. But this is not the case in practice. Uh, it, 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 in a way that the tokenization doesn't have to be um, unique. So if you, if you look at this one, you have a cholesterol and there is 21.05.2021 and then there is a number. So you could interpret this as a date where there is a dot missing or you, you could interpret this as, as, a, as, a, a, um, as, a, as a measurement. Yeah? So there are two ways you, you can view it. What, what is this thing here? And, um, and you don't know a priori which is correct. Um, if you look this one, you can see from wider context that this is probably incorrect because um, it is very unlikely that you have a cholesterol measurement, which is followed by the number, another number, another number, and then comes another um, kind of analyte and the measurement token. So you could infer that this one on top of is, is actually correct tokenization, but you can't do that um, uh, just by looking what is written here. And you have to take into account the wider context. And what this means is that you don't have, uh, at the end of the tokenization phase, you don't have a kind of um, unique tokenization, but you could have potentially many tokenizations and you can now have to decide which of those are correct or not. Um, and, and this is a problem because common kind of um, parsing algorithms uh, can't handle ambiguous um, tokenization. So when you have um, this kind of problem, you have to roll out your own parser, which, uh, which can handle kind of ambiguous tokenization and then disambiguate this tokenization based on the grammar itself. Okay, so um, this kind of uh, gives you a, uh, finishes the short overview of um, those um, uh, kind of uh, rule-based methods. And these are kind of uh, really, they have easy to, kind of uh, easy to apply and you get very quickly a decent progress. So you can let get most of the measurements out of it, but, uh, and, and you don't need this labeling and, uh, and gives you a good baseline. But the problem is that um, that that going um, going further from this baseline is really hard, and this is the kind of place where they fail because writing a very complex complex rules is hard. So it's um, it is almost impossible to write a correct phrase grammar for all ways how a, a doctor can write that patient smokes. Um, so, so that's why um, usually people kind of try to use um, uh, those uh, mach uh, machine learning methods or, and usually they start from supervised machine learning methods. And uh, the easiest one is this linear classifier idea. Um, and let's say, how does it work? Um, essentially, um, what a linear classifier does is it, it, it derives you these implicit rules. Let's say that you have indicator variables like cholesterol, which tells you whether a uh, phrase or term cholesterol is in, 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 the, in this text. And um, another indicator, which indicates whether term uh, H HDL, which is a type of um, cholesterol is in this text or LDL is in this text. And let's say that these are zero one variables and then you can come up with a linear rule which says that 
um, just um, take one time, one times cholesterol plus one times HDL plus one times LDL and subtract two. And if this um, sum is a positive, then you have um, a measurement uh, which uh, text contain cholesterol measurements. And uh, if, if it's below zero, then it doesn't. So, so this is kind of one potential kind of linear classification rule. And um, if you kind of think, what does it actually tell you? It tells you that um, either cholesterol and HDL is in the phrase or, or uh, other two combinations that they're based on this threshold. And the kind of idea of um, to using this linear classifier here is, is a kind of um, nice is that if you have enough examples, uh, then it will derive you this um, set of rules implicitly. Um, and, but, uh, and, and there are obviously several ways how you can do a linear classification and uh, this uh, support vector machine is, is usually the best one to use because it's a statistically stable. Um, uh, one, but obviously you can use a, a, a logistic regression as well. Um, and um, uh, the thing which makes this uh, support vector machine kind of um, stand out is that you can use uh, this uh, in introduce nonlinearity here. Because if you look here, what, what this rule is, is it is just a, you can um, kind of, um, observe um, only that, that you have this cholesterol and HDL together in this phrase, but you can't get this thing that the cholesterol and HDL are, are close together or, or more complex things. And, and this kind of idea of doing this non-linearity things using feature map and kernels allow you to kind of combine those basic facts in, in a kind of more non-linear way and, and get get more complex decisions not not only these rules but but, but somewhere where you have ors and ands in a more complex way yeah okay uh but but the problem with this um mm, to set it up uh, uh, kind of in practice so so there are two um, modes how you can operate so either you decide um, on the text whether it, it, it contains these cholesterol measurements or not, or you want to know where it contains. And this, the second one is, is kind of usually used. And if you do it in this way, what you have here is that you have a, a, a list of tokens for which you have to decide whether this is a measurement or not. And um, now, to do that, you, you have to kind of um, use information from uh, uh, nearby context. So you, you, you usually fix a window. So if you want to know whether this is a part of a measurement or not, so you let's say take two words from the left and two words to the right. And, and then for each of those words, uh, you add features on top of that. And um, usually when, when people did it early times, they do it kind of manually. So you have a term list. So you see that this is a cholesterol. Cholesterol is an analyte. So you have a feature like that, um, the, that there was a analyte, uh, two, um, two words to the left is, is one feature. Uh, or you could have a kind of, um, another feature is that you have an analyte to, <coughs> Uh, two words to the um, right, and you could have a phrase, phrase list as well, and, and uh, morphological features, for instance, that this is, seems to be a, a noun and not a verb, and, uh, and essentially based on that, you, you cook um, a set of features, and how do you define those features is non-trivial, and essentially there are like, um, many ways you can build. So, so you can say that here you have a cholesterol and, and, and a date 
to get there on the left and, and so on. But, but, but and, and you, your success is here determined uh, how well you define these features. Um, we in practice actually did this feature the design for, uh, let's say, what, uh, named entity recognition to recognize uh, uh, person names and organizations. And okay, those features were quite complex and how did we arrive to them was kind of very fuzzy. Uh, so usually you want to get rid of that. So you, you really don't want to uh, do this manual feature um, construction because this, you don't you, you you really don't know how to do it. Um, so the, the the way to get out of it is uh, is a word embedding. So uh, the idea here is that you use some sort of word embedder. Let's say a word to work, and what the word to work does, it takes a word. Uh, and outputs you a 100 or 1000, depend on your choice, informative features for each word. So you have a word and you get a vector out of it. And uh, those features have some sort of semantic information. They somehow encode that, okay, cholesterol is an alite, it's, it's, an, it's a noun and um, some other things. The nice thing about that is this is completely automatic. You mean in order to do that, you have to take a, a large set of text, run a word vector algorithm on top of that uh, with right configuration, but then you have this feature map. And, uh, and, and, and then you have this representation and then you can run the support vector machine on top of this embedding and this, what does this thing do is that um, you don't need now those handcraft word-based features. Those are kind of automatically arise from this embedding. But there is one thing you, you can't kind of ignore is you have to still uh, tell you how many symbols to the left you look and how many symbols to the right you look. And this is non-trivial and um, sometimes uh, the information is really, really far apart, which is important. And, 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 and if, you, if your window is small, then it doesn't kind of fit into it and therefore you make a uh, wrong decisions. Um, another thing is that although you can drain to uh, this embedding, it's essentially a dictionary. So there is like a finite number of words for which this embedding is known. So the, usually it's like 50,000 words, but um, if you have a medical text, there might be more words or misspellings uh, and, and therefore you, you, you somehow need to kind of decide how many words uh, you give up and say that those are unknown words. And another kind of um, problem with word embeddings is that you, and if you ignore the fact that the, um, that the word has a multiple meaning. So um, in, in English, there are like um, noun verb problems so that, uh, that, that you have a noun, which could be a verb. And in some context, you know what it is and actually knowing whether it's a verb or noun is kind of important in, in prediction. Um, the, uh, the way how these uh, embedders are actually trained is, 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 is a clever thing. It's quite old, but the idea is that you will take um, uh, unlabeled text and you somehow want to train this, uh, find those 1, 000, 100 features. So what you do is that you convert this unlabeled text into a labeled text by just um, taking a text deleting one word and you, you, you have now a prediction task that, okay, what is this word here? Yeah? And, uh, and since you know the answer, kind of, um, uh, you, you get a kind of infinite, kind of a very easily a large training set. And therefore this kind of thing works. Okay, um, but there was one other thing which I kind of, um, forgot to mention in case of um, uh, fact extraction, 
is that uh, let's say we do this um, prediction. So, and we have this fixed window. This means that I make a prediction separately to each uh, element. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to say that okay, this uh, let's say is a part of measurement. This and then I make a decision whether this is a part of measurement, whether this is a part of measurement, and so on. But all of those decisions are independently done. And this can lead to a, a problem where, okay, let's see that this is a part of cholesterol measurement. This is not a part of measurement. This is a part of measurement and this is part of measurement. Here, I have a kind of a, a, a part of um, prediction that this is HTL measurement, obviously, because this contains HTL. And this, this is also an HTL measurement because, okay, HTL is nearby and it has a right unit. But by some odd reason, I have decided that this is actually a part of cholesterol measurement. And, and this is kind of uh, not reasonable because it is very unlikely that inside this um, measurement uh, is, um, is another measurement. So there is something wrong with this is essentially that this output is not consistent because I made individual measurements. So the way you can kind of uh, get to uh, handle this is that you will have a separate rule about the measurement consistency. So essentially you are going to say that the measurements are single blocks of text. Uh, and, and, and formally, you model that with a mark of random fields uh, and, and this essentially takes this thing and gives you a probability assignment for this labeling and tells that this is very unlikely. And by, while, while this one where this would be a measurement is more likely and if I would swap this one to orange and this would be even more likely. Um, and uh, now if I have a SVM predictions and a mark of random field, which does this um, kind of consistency checking, I can combine those two and, um, and kind of uh, improve my prediction and say that, okay, this is my original one. But if I flip this one, okay, um, uh, as, as, as overall, this is more probable uh, and and this is the idea behind this conditional random fields. So what they do is they, they kind of uh, uh, train two things simultaneously. First of all, this consistency model uh, of labels, uh, which is this model by mark of random fields. And second one, this uh, individual token prediction things. And, and okay, they combine that and therefore they can kind of detect those errors which are not um, detected if you make those um, individual predictions. But um, in practice, the difference is not so big. Um, the, the reason here is that, okay, the, the, the consistency requirements are quite simple. Um, there is not very complex structure to learn. Yeah? Um, so, so this is one thing. So by looking at the labels, it's, it's quite hard to detect that I have kind of consistently kind of uh, uh, incorrectly labeled this, let's say, instead of a cholesterol to, to something else. So, so I can't detect these errors. And the other one is that if you have a good, let's say, SVM predictor or some other kind of predictor for individual values, Although those kind of predictions are independent, they reuse the same data and therefore they are correlated. And, and these things what happen here are very unlikely. So uh, when you are faced whether to use the kind of individual predictions or your conditional random fields, um, okay, those are slightly better. But if for technical reasons, you can't apply the conditional random fields because they don't work with your data or data format, you, you don't lose much if you use the support vector machine prediction or, or other linear kind of prediction. Okay, um, 
there is this uh, last thing to kind of consider here is, is I have still one problem here. Uh, uh, is that, um, that I have to think about the window size. And this is a problem because if I take a wrong window size, it's too large, then I kind of can't train it. Um, I, have, I have kind of, uh, uh, it doesn't converge and uh, the, it's, it's kind of overfits. And if I take a, a too small window, then important information is left out. So there is another kind of uh, advancement, which is this context sensitive word embeddings, which take uh, care of this one. And, um, and here, um, instead of um, having a dictionary, I will have a neural network uh, usually those uh, are transformer types of networks. So what, what they do is that they take into, uh, let's say a sentence, um, we kind of pass it and for each word, they assign um, uh, this uh, 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 informative features, but those are now um, depending where the word occurs, what are the surrounding words and so on. Uh, but again, the, the way how this thing is trained is still the same. So you have this mass language modeling task where you just um, drop uh, some word inside of a sentence and try to predict what it is. And uh, by doing this, you get a, again, a really huge training set, which allows you to train a very complex neural network. And this takes a lot of time. I think the Estonian, um, uh, BERT model, which is one of those neural network, uh, was training about a week. Uh, but, but then again, if you train a neural network, you have this problem that you have to fix some weird hyperparameters. And if you put them incorrectly, the thing doesn't converge and gives you wrong answers. So you, it, it can actually take many, many months to get it correct. But one thing which is cool is when you have finally kind of nailed that one, you can use that model for many, many tasks. Uh, and the way you, the, what the transformers kind of solve is another issue that now you don't have an observation thing then. So essentially those um, embeddings are, are assigned based on the entire sentence. So the information from uh, any part of a sentence uh, can uh, uh, kind of uh, mm can be used there. And it also resolves the second one is that it gives you different meanings. Um, and now the way how you use it is that you take this um, context sensitive embeddings and uh, based on that, uh, you, you build another classifier on top of that. And um, when you do it smartly, you, you also, kind of as just the neural network for um, which you have, meaning that it doesn't uh, kind of uh, output the same uh, embeddings, but those are slightly tuned. Um, and it, it works surprisingly well, uh, but there are some um, problems is that uh, you can't capture this stark background knowledge. If the neural network can learn only the things which are inside a text cell, um, there is no way the neural network can learn ATC codes uh, for, um, let's say, a drugs or a, some codes for the analyze if they are not inside the text. So you still have to use this background information. Okay. Um, and this kind of gives you a, a kind of overview what, how you can solve the things. But there is a last thing I want to mention. This is a really brief one, is how you kind of improve um, your results. So um, there are like um, three main sources of improvement what, when you have a system. Um, first of all, you should always work with the term list and ontologies. Um, and the, whatever you do, you have to just um, use a kind of uh, version them so that um, 
that you, you can make those small improvements and you can somehow communicate and document them. So if somebody looks at them, let's say a couple of years afterwards, it can, it can understand why some terms were added or some terms were deleted. And this can give you a kind of um, very big improvements because um, essentially the term lists define you the features uh, and the background information which is not inside the uh, text usually. So this is the stock information which you enrich. Um, the second fact is also obvious is that um, when you do this extraction, you, you have a version one extractor, version second, two extractor and so on, if it's a long project, then you have to actually measure um, that, that what you do actually makes sense. So you have to create uh, dedicated test sets for each isolated problem. Um, so if you have, let's say, problems with cholesterol um, measurements, so then you have to make a separate test set to, just to isolate that problem. Um, and, uh, and the obvious thing is that um, what, what I said is that you have to have, after the uh, extraction, you have to have this um, validation um, routines, which actually check whether whatever you extracted from the data, that this actually is, um, is, 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 is internally consistent. So, and this allows you to kind of uh, discover um, certain types of um, errors and that kind of, and that improves the kind of outcome. So we have um, extracted the uh, measurements and I think we have, uh, the initial version was quite good, but then we just looked at for certain types of invariance, um, stating that if you have extracted a measurement, it has to have an analyte inside or otherwise it's, it's just a number, but uh, there were kind of significant um, proportion of those where there was only a number. Um, by looking at these and tracing them back, we, we could kind of uh, find out that there was a slight shift in, in, in some patterns and this, this was kind of mismatch during the extraction uh, and so on. So the, in general, as you should check the outcomes that, that they are correct and any other kind of statistical anomaly tests are kind of good here in this case. Another thing to note is the problem of diminishing returns. So um, let's say that you have some sort of extraction system and let's say you measure the accuracy and, and you use certain type of um, an algorithm and then uh, and you have trained this uh, for, for the training set size, which is 100. And you can kind of measure two things here. One of them, let's say is a, uh, training set accuracy, which is an overestimation of actual accuracy. And you can measure the um, kind of um, test set accuracy. And for this uh, training set of size 100, let's say these are fluctuating around 75%. Um, now, if you would have the training set, which is smaller, obviously the uh, test set accuracy would be smaller because you, you, you can't learn everything from the examples, uh, while the um, test set accuracy, uh, no, 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 sorry, uh, training set accuracy could be kind of larger because you have smaller set, you can overfit the data and therefore the accuracy is, is larger. So, so uh, and, and so on, you can kind of do a couple of experiments and, and see how those two lines progress. So this, in this case, the uh, this uh, set accuracy kind of grows and now plateaus. And, and similarly, you have the same thing for training set accuracy. And obviously when you have enough data, those two uh, will kind of uh, match. And, and the place where they match gives you the maximal performance of this type of, uh, of, of this algorithm. 
And uh, by looking at these lines, you can uh, do two things. First of all, notice that, okay, let's label half of the data more. How much do I gain? And here it seems that less than a percent. So this doesn't make sense. Um, so this is one thing. And um, uh, this is this is the kind of the, the main thing is to know how much does does labeling additional uh, samples uh, give you advantage. And uh, if you are here, obviously you should label more. But if you are here, this tells you that you should do something different. Because, okay, there is no reason to label more. You should try to work with features or try different methods uh, or something else. So this is kind of important thing to recall or remember. Um, the last thing, which is uh, which is something which people rarely talk about is that whenever you see some precision and accuracy measurements, uh, most of them are kind of not very relevant. Um, the problem is in the, in, in the fact that um, you need a really, really large um, test set to measure accurately. For instance, if you want to estimate precision in um, 1%, then you have to actually have really, really many measurements in the worst case. So usually if you have thousand measurements, the measurement error is around 3%. So and this is a problem. Um, and you can actually go um, kind of um, past this problem um, by using a different approach. So, but the problem is, is that you, since you can't estimate the precision with well, the, the accuracy with precision more than 1%, uh, you can't see whether you're actually making a progress or not. Because uh, essentially the improvement might be smaller than the, the variance of this um, kind of uh, test error. Uh, and the way out is, is that you have to actually use a relevant, relative performance um, measurement. So you have a baseline classifier, which is reasonably close, and now your new method. And then you evaluate them on unlabeled data and you look only the differences they make. And you select, let's say 100 or 1000 those differences, and then you manually check which one of them is correct. And if both of them are incorrect, then you label that those are incorrect. And then you now can measure these uh, two things, the improvement ratio, whether the new algorithm was uh, more correct than the old one, and how frequently that those differences arise. And if you use those two factors, you can actually uh, quite easily to measure how much the new algorithm is better in absolute terms and this estimate is much much more precise than you would obtain on a training set the problem here is now that whenever you do you have to do a manual label but um, but this is kind of um, the last aspect i wanted to kind of consider here so um just to recap you have a lot of methods you should start with rule-based methods uh, because you need, um, they can give you the answer quickly. And if they don't give you the answer quickly, they at least allow you to build up a um, reasonable training set. And only after that, you can do this um, kind of uh, machine la learning afterwards. Okay, this would be all from my side. Thank you very much, Sven, for this very informative and important talk. Um, are there any questions for Sven? Uh, someone raised their hand. Uh, Diane raised your hand. Please, you can ask a question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my question is, um, in Catherine's introduction, it was mentioned that you are also working on, on cryptography and security. So um, since medical texts are sensitive data, could you elaborate a bit on how to extract information from medical texts using cryptography protocols? Um, is it something that is done? 
uh, are there any trends or any recommendation? Okay, so uh, let's say that you, uh, so this is a completely different question, but I will answer. So uh, doing fact extraction is so laborsome. So uh, if you do, let's say, run this uh, BERT algorithm, you train that one, this runs one uh, month in a, uh, on a computer, okay. Now, if you do a privacy preserving algorithm, so what essentially what you do is that you multiply this running time by factor of thousand or by factor of million. So this tells you that this is infeasible. So um, doing a fact extraction is, is something which you, you which you need to do on a raw data. Okay, so it's mo it's mostly a matter of time. Yeah, this is a, a problem of uh, running time. So let's say one um, month. So you are not willing to wait like a um, thousand months in order to get your results. Even it, it is much, much easier somehow to agree, get this agreement that you run this on a secure server thing. So that is the, the, and the issue. There is a way to do it in a privacy preserving way if you use hardware. So you, you know that Intel has this uh, secure in place and which are essentially that you, you, you run a computer which is not controlled by you inside uh, your computer. This is, and, and, and you, are not, you, you cannot access that. So I think um, in this setup, it's possible to do kind of privacy preserving um, uh, kind of uh, info, information extraction because then you can just say that in your, in your computer, there is another computer which nobody can access and, and do, do that there. But uh, this would require uh, certain legal precedents to be... Yes, for sure. But it gives a burden to someone else, like, you know, the computer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for this question. Are there any further questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, uh, you mentioned. So first of all, thanks for the talk. It was interesting. So you mentioned uh, that after the training and validation, the work doesn't stop. Um, I wanted to know uh, what um, are basically the steps, or what is the work done after that, um, after the validation, and could you give examples of that? Okay, um, this is, um, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, let, let me kind of uh, go to this um, uh, thing here. So let's say that you have a text and you have extracted the weights. So, or, or any kind of facts. Uh, there are like now, um, there, there are like, uh, uh, several levels of correctness. Um, as I said, whether this fact is correct, so this is, this is by them done before, and then whether it's correct in, in the context. And uh, let's say what kind of validations you can do. And this is, uh, this is the place where, which is kind of hard. Um, let's, uh, let's say you take the measurements. In case of measurements, uh, there are certain values of um, cholesterol levels where you can be alive. And the, the most basic validation would be that, okay, if the value is, is outside of that range, this is incorrect way. Uh, the, the, uh, this is kind of uh, the most simplest one. Uh, the, the other uh, kind of another obvious one is that you will uh, draw a timeline uh, for this patient and see whether there are sudden abrupt changes uh, uh, which can kind of um, kind of indicate that uh, okay this can't happen like like that you have the cholesterol level then it kind of increases like tenfold and the next time it's also the same so probably this is important so uh, these are kind of kind of classical uh, input data validation methods. Um, if you want to kind of look at the context, or meaning that you look at the text and you want to know um, 
uh, can you use um, the uh, this text to kind of get hints whether this value is correct or not? Then uh, in this case, um, you you have these questions. Um, okay, we have the measurement. So mm -hmm. what type? Uh, how this was measured? Okay, and who was measured? Uh, and, and this is something which you can can be done based on text. So uh, for the weight extraction, uh, we have certain kind of detectors which detect whether um, uh, whether the text actually mentions that this weight is measured uh, not for the patient themselves but for the um, for the child. Okay, but there there are um, yet yet another issue is that. Uh, sometimes you have measurements which have a different date. So it's, it tells you that the patient had a particular measurement value 10 years. Okay, so there are like many aspects you, you can layer on top of this basic measurement. And um, where you stop uh, is, it depends how much time and resources you have. But um, I think for practical purposes, um, just the basic input data validation that, um, okay, the, you just draw the um, kind of, um, what is this, um, histograms and look for outliers would, would be okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then Giovanni, please. Hi, thank you for your talk. I have a general question, actually. I wanted to know if there are uh, efforts that you are aware of to standardize this type of medical entries so that it could either simplify these extraction tasks uh, significantly or um, make it like so that we can very directly find the information that we want. I understand that the challenges of something like that are uh, enormous, but are you aware of any effort in that direction? Okay, so you, you, the, the, um, um... Okay, so there are like, um, um, let me think. Um, okay, so essentially there is a body of standards, yeah, which is uh, quite uh, good. So um, the, the SNOMED standard um, is kind of, um, kind of very broad and it specifies a lot of things. And if you have um, in, in your native language, language of interest, you have this standard translated, then you can use it. Um, for the lab measurements, you have this uh, Loing standard, uh, and you have those um, kind of. Um, this is this. Uh, uh, this is something which uh, which my coworkers work is this OMOP uh, data platform, which has this um, kind of. Um, common data description um, language. And there, there are many, many checks and kind of tools which allow you to do stuff. But, uh, but if you are working very close to the facts, then, uh, then you have to roll them out by yourself. Um, you know, I have the, in, in practice, I have had this problem that do we have a, uh, for each analyte, a, a, kind of a range where it can be. And actually this is, this is not right now available. There are some preprints in the OMOP system, but, uh, but, 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 but I'm not aware of a kind of very large standardization because it's very heterogeneous problems. So everybody has a different problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand, I suspect it. So thank you. Great, thanks a lot. And we have one, time for one last brief question and answer. Uh, Lucas, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Catherine. And thanks a lot, Sven, for, for the talk. I was wondering on the same lines as what Diane said uh, of uh, privacy preservation, um, if you can use something like what you showed in slide five of uh, like fact extraction to detect sensitive data in a text and uh, kind of anonymize it before um, the fact extraction as a pre-processing step. So you can, I don't know if remove, but uh, mitigate the problem of handling sensitive data. Mm, okay, the, the, there are, I have a personal kind of belief is that um, you should do the um, kind of te test, text processing uh, in, a, in a safe environment. 
And after these results have been extracted, you should use those in privacy preserving settings. So um, in a way that it's, it's much easier to work with raw data to handle those hiccups. Uh, and afterwards, when it's in the right format, then you should uh, do that. But obviously, uh, you, if you, yeah, if you kind of uh, derive those algorithms, and if you can run them in secure computational environments, this is one way that you derive the algorithm and then securely deploy that and make sure that it doesn't do anything else, treat it as a black box, get the results out encrypted or in whatever way and then kind of process them later on. This is one way to do it. And this is, I think it's, it's, a, it's the future. Okay, thanks a lot. Great, thanks a lot. Uh... And with that, we thank uh, Sven again for his talk. We send a round of virtual applause. And we will have a break until 10.30, and we will reconvene at 10.30 sharp. Have a good break. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>